give in. <laughs> do, 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 do. We got the world spinning right in our hands. Baby, rain or shine. All the time. We got each other. Sharing the laughter and love. Okay, good. Anyways, uh, so... Foxy Lady's uh, beautiful expression of uh, joy and happiness uh, is uh, is a is a mirror of her emotions as we come in today for our Amateur Friday readings. Um, so we uh, we're gonna read over the log lines. Uh, we're gonna do an accelerated version, so we're gonna read five pages minimum this time, and then we're gonna read one of the uh, one of one of our Twitch viewers streams it's, uh, named Smishmosh. 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 And uh, she has two children's screenplays for us to take a quick look at. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go quickly through amateur offerings because we still want to always generate some new new learnings from this stuff. And then off we go. Uh, I see a comment. Let's see what this is. Me, 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 me. <laughs> What's up, Smish Moosh? Hello. Yeah, so we're going to do a quick uh, speed, speed mode of amateur offerings, and then we'll be... Onto your masterpiece, so I'm excited. This will be a fun day. Cool. Um, so let's take a look at the log lines. Um, Eternal lies. When an ancient, when ancient relics wash ashore in the South Pacific, a team of scientists sets sail to investigate. They, cl the closer they draw to their origin, the further they flail from reality. It's kind of an odd wording. Um, I'm just gonna break this out so I can actually. Hey, Smish Smush. We're happy to look. It's always I'm excited to see your uh, your awesome work. So if you're not, I'm gonna close this out. Boom. All right. Uh, cool. So that's kind of cool. Call of Cthulhu plus shining on a boat. Yep. That's, um, that on sounds. That sells me. Sickness and health. A middle-aged playboy hires a woman to marry him, so his dying father can realize his dream of seeing him walk down the aisle. When the father says the show shines of a miracle recovery, a couple is forced to prolong the charade. That sounds pretty funny. I'd watch that. Yeah. Uh, Pandora's box of the tragic death of their five-year-old son, Ryan. The Taylor family began to experience paranormal phenomena. In a desperate attempt to contact their son, the family turned to a voodoo witch who was cursed with the gift to see the dead. Sounds like insidious. Yeah, it's, it's a little vague, too, because I don't see a clear goal. I just see kind of they want to contact this kid and something bad happens. Um, it seems like almost more, like, just kind of running away from evil supernatural, like, doesn't really give you enough runway for, like, a full story. So usually you're wanting to see I mean, desperate attempt to contact their son. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's horror, but it's... Hmm. It, that particular one doesn't doesn't have anything like so unique that it's really bringing me out either. A tense survival thriller centered on a windowed mother whose confidence is tested when she and her children are stalked by an aggressive grizzly bear. I don't like bears. Yeah, it doesn't like bears. Like that scene in The Revenant. Yeah. Not my favorite. Not her favorite. Couldn't really watch it. Confidence is tested when she and her children are stalked. Yeah, but I don't know. Centered on a. Uh, Thanks. Is that a new yeah. smish smish? Oh, it's now hosting. Oh, thanks yeah. for the host. <laughs> I thought it said following. I was like, oh, but I thought, I thought smish was also. Thank you for the host. Um, so this looks... Teen Survival, Teen Survival Thrill, Son of a Widowed Mother. Yeah, I, I think the thing that I, I struggle with here is it, is it just kind of seems like you're just running away from the bear the whole time, and like that may be tough to manage as far as a story um like, you know think about is tested yeah I think a lot more than her confidence would be tested by that it's true um but let's like think about revenant like they had this revenge the only way they kind of pulled that off and i don't even think they pulled it off that well was they had a revenge story a very strong character goal uh underneath it um so and the bear thing was only inside an incident not the full screenplay and that's partially because that you may struggle to have a full story really emerge from that mm -hmm. In colonial Argentina, the bastard son of a widow peasant woman rallies a free and conscious against a ruthless invader queen. That sounds cool, but there's nothing too, too unique about it. Yeah. It just kind of sounds like, oh, he stops the bad, bad queen. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm kind of looking fact for... that it's period, there needs to be, like, something exciting. Yeah, and something ironic. Like, oh, it's like a history lesson. Like, okay. 
then the journey like the the widowed son and coming and beating a queen that's not to, that's something we've seen a lot before so like you you want to look for your way of turning it into something that's more distinctive I read North of Fear in its entirety and really liked it packed with conflict Ooh. oh wow Interesting. Well, maybe uh, maybe we must. I don't like bears. Just <laughs> I just I my phobia for whatever reason is being eaten alive by a bear. It's true. I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the challenge is it's just yeah. I don't know the North of Fear. I don't think her logline tells expresses what she intends, but you know, so it yeah. goes. Because I think if it's really a good story, um, you usually see a good logline. Um, and that one, I don't know if it's really bringing out, like, especially mentioning the genre and the logline is not something you commonly see. What up, Casey? How's it going? Oh, hello. But it's not oh, all about the bear. The bear. That's true. Hopefully. Reflected in the logline. Hopefully. Line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I know. We're Excuse both me. drinking soda, so there may be some, Pardon. um, some fun stuff anyways. Cool. Um, so that's the, so I think I'm going to pick... Uh, first two, just because yeah. psychological horror balanced with the comedy. I agree. I think yeah. the first two as well. Those are cool. at least the strongest log lines. Maybe uh, we've actually almost n we've never not picked the winner from log lines when we've done this. Oh, rarely, yeah. No, I, I don't think we've ever not chosen a log line. I think one time been, there's been a couple times we, maybe where we've not like voted for the winner one, one time. Yeah, yeah. We didn't vote for the winner one time, but then we never... We've always, like, at least read it. Yeah, I think so, that was important. Logline makes a difference, and maybe we're just, like, divas on loglines, but so it goes. <laughs> Not all about the bear. It's good. It's good. Um, cool. Uh, so let's see. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this beautiful thing here. And if I can do that... Come on, buddy. Maybe I'll just delete it. We got each other, sharing the laughter. Boom. 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 Eternal lies. I don't know why I have the Goring Pings theme song stuck in my head. I don't know either. <laughs> I haven't thought of that in years, and I still have every word memorized. I well, the most merciful thing in the world is the inability of the human mind. To correlate all its contents. See, I like HP Lovecraft. This is going to be good. That's true. Let me make sure it's, it's actually showing good. up, and it's not, so I'm glad I checked. My diva. My, the, the problem with OBS, it's an absolute princess. Come on, buddy. I don't know nothing about that. No, you don't know nothing about princesses. You poor princesses stuck in the, stuck in the dark world. <laughs> it's a tough life. Mm -hmm. All right, let me see. I can bring my notes in here. Boop. Yeah, and then I'll bring this over here. So we're doing some fun writing tutorials, so if that sounds interesting, YOLO. Uh, anyways, fade in. Uh, ominous ocean, vast and unfathomable, clouds time-lapse on the horizon. We follow a single breaker as it gives way and rolls towards the shore. Inside this wave, a small relic glides to a halt on a sandy beach. Exterior beach, Easter Island day. A rural fishing village, huts and shacks scattered across an island landscape. A community hard at work, men haul in the day's catch, day apostrophe. Is that? I think mm -hmm. it's the day's apostrophe. Yes. Day. Spelling, please, not now. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and put um, SS five one. Wait, five one notes. Uh, and this will be replies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, P one. Yeah, you're usually uh, risky. You know, it's like not good. Uh, so just be careful with that. I've done the same thing before. Had like weird things. So you can't ever get it perfect, but um, you know, and it's always like you always like turn the screenplay and you're like, oh my god, wait, okay. wait, God no! And then it's yeah. So I get it. I get it, but you just be careful. You know. Um, Okay, women clean fish and prepare meals for their families. On the beach, three boys kick a makeshift soccer ball. Calais, five, a small Polynesian boy, 
desperately tries to keep up with his other siblings. Candy's mother calls from a nearby hut. What does Rapanui mean? How was your birthday? My oh. birthday was good. There were cigars and um, cigars and and whiskey. Yeah. So I can't really argue with that. And then I wrote. And we danced a little bit. And we danced, and I wrote. So it was about an ideal, about as ideal as it gets, doing writing, cigars, whiskey. Yeah. Right now I'm drinking my water, though, and being healthy. Kaylee cha uh, cha chases after the ball. The eldest brother smiles and punts it over Kaylee's head and is a crush. What are you talking about? Rapa Nui, under Kaylee's mother. Just I have no idea. Okay. I've never used okay. that. I also discourage the use of parentheticals because it's always not the best device. But let me see. Uh, oh, so she's speaking Polynesian. Oh, okay, got it. That makes sense. Oh, that, so then the way you would do that is you would say, like, speaking Polynesian subtitled. Um, so let's just, I would be, just use a parenthetical correctly. Unless you don't want us to hear it, because that tells me she's just speaking Rapa Nui. Um, and then we just don't understand her. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which could be the case. People have done that before. Uh, oh, it's covering the script? Yes. No. We don't want that. I'll move oh, it yeah, over. Yeah. Boop. Over our heads. Yes. Put it over the heads. Sweet. Oh, let's make it small. Yeah. Bink, bink. Alright, off we go. Okay. Thank you for the heads up. Uh, um, Kaylee uh, chases after the ball. The elder brother smiles and punts it over Kaylee's head into the crashing waves. Undeterred, Kaylee turns on his heels and sprints after the ball. His brothers head to their hut and sit down at the table for dinner. The mother looks up from the table. Kaylee stands at the water's edge. She turns to prepare another plate. Rapa Nui. Kaylee, now! Kaylee pays her no mind. He is mesmerized. By the relic at his feet, he reaches down and picks it up. Don't touch the relics. That's a never great idea. Did you see the, uh, the, the moment Kaylee touches the relic, his eyes turn solid black. His face drains of emotion, then as if in a trance, he walks into the waves, deeper and deeper, until the ocean claims him. Kaylee's mother turns back with a place of food in her hand. The soccer ball rolls up with the tide. Kaylee? Her son is gone. <gasps> good. So good I intro. Like I mean, I think... Sweet. Yes, exactly. Intro... Tough to have a non main character opening, but keep it short and punchy. Which you do. Yay. Awesome job. <laughs> Can I know? I know. Yeah, poor Kaylee. Okay, cool. So, interior college lecture hall day. A standard university lecture hall. More empty seats than not. A handful of students check their phones, doodle in their notebooks, and watch the clock. In front of the class stands Dr. Joseph Wexler, distressed in jeans and wrinkled sports clothes, hair disheveled and unkept dark bags from his eyes. So, while Mesopotamia is widely acknowledged as the cradle of civilization, recent discoveries have raised other possibilities. A female student raises her hand. But the Gulf of Kambat, Kambay, Katal Huig. Atlantis. Uh, suppressed la laughter from the class. Um, Steve Riggins, Wuxer's faithful teaching assistant, silences them with a glare. They're all just theories. Why argue against thousands of years of accepted archaeological evidence? Because if we accepted everything written in textbooks as absolute, the Earth would be flat and Pluto would be a planet. Things change. Pluto is, is a planet again now, right? No. It got reinstated? No. Okay. no. More laughter from the students. Wexler turns and scribbles theorems on the whiteboard. The back door opens. The young woman enters, takes a seat in the back row. This is Dr. Alexander Young, cocky, confident. She crosses her legs and winks at Steve. Nice. So, 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 okay. It's okay. a good character intro, intro for Alexander. So that gives me two things, um, which is something everybody should be thinking about. It gives me a relationship. It gives me a picture of the person and insight into a relationship. That's really well done. Uh, so this is, okay, 
It's our job to question everything. Our perception of reality is built on theories. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> theories. Uh, ah. Lower the... Oh, can you lower the script because it's cut off the top? Oh. Oh. Oh, oh I see. Boop. Yeah. Better? Um, I'm just trying to get it just fitting there. Maybe I'll shrink it down. Yeah, one day I'll actually get like a nice normal setup, but... Relativity is built on theories. Theories that are created and perpetuated by an imperfect instrument, the human mind. Buxa turns back to the class and sees Alex. He swallows hard, his eyes narrow. She offers an apologetic smile. She smiles. She knows she shouldn't be here. Thrusts her hand in the air. Wexler, Wex, Wexler shakes his head. Class, we have an unexpected guest. Please welcome renowned oceanographer, Dr. Alexander Young. Dr. Wessler, please forgive me if I'm oversimplifying your assertion. Are you saying that the human mind is incapable of understanding the universe? Dr. Gallum, I'm an archaeologist first and an anthropologist second. That's <sighs> twice that they've misused A and M, though. That's bugging me. Where? There's A, anthropologist, and up here it was end apologetic smile. Oh, oh, whoa. I, I forgave that one, but then it was there, too, so just a little note. An and apologetic smile and a anthropologist. Yeah. Just be careful. <laughs> One's okay, but. <laughs> so <pretty important>. uh. <laughs> People like the double bass, though, don't they? <laughs> I'll type lightly. I usually I have my headphones, um, but whenever there's when two people, here, it's yeah. trickier. Though I guess I could use the headphones; they pick up pretty well. Um, let me see. Do 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 do. Um, let's do spelling. This is page. Three, I think. Uh, spelling on and boom, 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 boom. Uh, and and the thunder of the gods. It's, it's actually just imagine like a hammer in the souls of all the writers. Just the, every time the keyboard strikes, just the hammer. <laughs> And some poor writer out there being like, "That's my." He's actually a necromancer, and it's pulling me out. Yeah, I'm a, I am a necromancer in my. Uh, I am a necromancer in my <laughs> RPG, so maybe it says something. Soon, <laughs> one day I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to get on it one day. Um, yeah, maybe I'll. I have this old mic at the office that I never use. Maybe we'll use that. Um, cool. Uh, however, I'm humble enough to accept that humanity is, but a blip in the hands of time. What do you think about this dialogue? Um, it's a bit telly. There's not much conflict. I'm just thinking because they're very long. Yeah. Is it okay because he's teaching? Yeah, that would be what you could get away with. Um, and he has some people interrupt him, which breaks it up, which is good, but you still have some pretty long chunks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more philosophizing. And, you know, you really want to make sure that this comes back into, like, the story. Our job is to question everything, the perceptions of the mind. However, I'm humble enough to accept the humanity is but a slip in the hands of time. Da, 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 da. I mean, like, just the fact that we're starting to skim it when we read it is probably indicative of the fact that there's a lot and probably a little bit too much. Um, yeah, I mean, those philosophical conversations and dialogue are usually best when there's, like, two people with opposing philosophies that are actually acting them out, and then you see that one is wrong um, by just its actions. So always, you know, actions speak louder than words. So beware there. Um, Walter checks his watch for all the time we have for today. Next week, Chapter 3 and 4 of Reed's Mesopotamia. Kids flock to the exit, watch them sit down at his desk and punches a few keys on his laptop. Alexander crosses Tim. Joe, oh, sorry, it's you. Or it's me. Joe, I know I shouldn't be here. She's like this really seductive lady, yeah, I'm yeah, guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a really and old the, man. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> Not like your delivery. Alexander closes the computer. Wes looks up annoyed. She drops a folder on his desk. We found it. Interior, Wester's office, college day. Sits at his desk. Pouring over stacks and stacks. Photos and data, like a kid in a candy store. Could this be a wreck, or just a natural occurring formation? Alex thumbs through the stack of photos and hands him a sonar image of what looks like the ruins of an ancient city. Definitely not natural. It's massive. How big? 
big, I mean really big. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> shame, shame. <laughs> Makes Giza look like a teepee. Lesser like sits. Teepee. Lesser sits back pondering. Where's the site? Alex hands Joe another document. Nemo. Nemo. There's nothing there. There is now. They surveyed that area a dozen times. No way they missed this. Four years ago. So one thing I would say is this is very... There's nothing unique about this dialogue. This is very much like action-adventure explorer dialogue, like bullet point for point. Uh, and, um, you know, you there's kind of two things that would spice this dialogue up. Uh, one is inner character conflict, because then, you know, she winked at him and he was all uncomfortable. Like, but that seems to have vanished here. Um... And the other is, you know, actual, like, some sort of, like, personality trait that's, like, really coming across, or some sort of scene dynamic where a character's walking around and doing stuff, and, like, you know, like, you know, this is kind of talking heads. Like, they're kind of handing each other documents, but nothing much is happening. Um, like, you know, people, they'll, like, you know, in, when they had this moment in the movie Sahara, which was a kind of a, a thief movie, they were pulling out this thing out of the water and they were like go get the thing like you know lift the winch and then people were running around while he was like yeah we're looking for this thing watch out Billy there's a plank coming and he's like yeah but we're gonna go get this golden thing yeah so like you know uh, yeah, this, this, this doesn't have any of those things um, not the strongest most unique I'm always see dialogue and then I just wanna see Cthulhu. yeah I wanna see Cthulhu um, scene, like, see what this has called a scene agitator. So you can use a scene agitator or conflict or character, con character conflict or, um, scene agitator. oh, whoops. Yeah, the editor gets edited. Um, or just like uh, more dynamic. Uh, character quirk stuff like that can help. Ooh, where does Arno <laughs> ever <laughs> change the channel? How do I change the channel? <laughs> Good old Alex. <laughs> the Giza, Wexler. the Giza tent. They both have X's in their names, so. Wexler and Alex. I, I guess that's true. That's. Uh, <laughs> Alex reaches into her bag, pulls out photos of relics, and she Wait, hands them to us. Did we just skip some stuff? Oh, whoops. I Sorry, missed four it. Four years. Oh, yeah. Uh, there is now. Okay. Area mm -hmm. doesn't the time. Four years ago, so his headphones picked up massive rumble. Picks up a book from his desk, Atlantis the Lost Civilization by Dr. Wessler. She thumbs through a few pages, sits on his desk. That could be anything. Alex lays out charts of seismic activity on the desk. There's increasing seismic activity from the same location. It's close enough to tectonic to the specific plate. That's not all. Alex reaches into her bag and pulls out photos of relics. She hands them to Russler. Yeah, I, I mean, especially if one... Especially if it's multiple. Yeah, where did you find these? Drawings of similar relics. Like, are they statues? Yeah. Are they pots? Are they jewelry? Uh, yeah. I think you would probably, the, the ideal, I think, way to do this um, would be to probably have, you know, photos of relics, but then one stands out and he's like, what is this? And it's like a little idol or something that's like magic, I don't know. Um, where did you find these? Okay, we're digging through the file cabinet, sits back down, takes black and white photos. They've been washing up in the shores of Ducey, Motununu. Yeah, I have no idea what a relic is. Yeah, exactly. Anything it's, old, basically. Yeah, but what they have been washing up... So that vagueness is always tough because then you're leaving that decision of what to make what to make the prop up to some random person. Um, uh, bingo! I think the earthquake shifted something, and here it is: your long lost civilization. Alex picked up a picture from Wessler's desk. It's a family shot of Wessler's wife and his son. Wessler's wife has a striking resemblance to Alex. Wessler snatches a photo from Alex, sets it down carefully. Can you keep your hands to yourself? Alex postures up and leans in. I'm heading there tomorrow. I want you with me. 
No. No way. I don't do water. Not anymore. Uh, yeah. Uh, Alex reaches across the desk and touches Wester's hand. Oh. If this is what we think it is, I want you there. I need you there. It's mid-semester. I, I can't just get up and leave. You spent your entire life trying to prove this place exists. This is your chance. You'll be fine without me. Then do it for Lily. Proof of theory. You owe her. Get out. Well, I didn't mean. Now. Think about it. <laughs> kind of feels like South Park. <laughs> yeah, that's also I'm using South Park for. Yeah, yeah, me too. That could be why. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to, because we're doing turbo mode tonight. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap this thing up here. Um, this last dialogue exchange is a little bit like is predictable. predictable. Like, no, don't talk about my past. <laughs> but I need you there. Um, so the good, um, I think it's a good launch to the story. Strong start to plot. Good use intro scene. These are tricky to pull off. And then improve, I would say dialogue. Um, and then what stems out of that is, you know, characters seem cookie cutter. How to Yeah, so I think they kind of are a little bit tropey right now, where it's very much like, oh, like, I'm like the agonized so-and-so and this, that. So yeah. just be beware of that. I, I don't think it's going to kill your story, because I think you have a strong enough plot engine going, um, but it's uh, a bit risky. Okay, sickness and health. W. W. I'm going to assume that means winner and immediately make this my vote. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You have a woman's bedroom. That sounds risque. Whoa. Jake, nearing 40, heads for second base with a woman almost half his age, 22, when his phone rings. Man. Sorry, this might be important. Ooh, so I'm not a big fan yeah, of much. using... So people do this, it's common, but I think it just bodes, it smacks of pretentiousness. Um, using metaphor as someone's tag. Uh, seems a bit show coffee. Just name character. I mean, I would just name the character a real name. So, because if you have more than a few lines of dialogue, you want that character named, right? Um, or else it just becomes, they become, it's a like weird floating thing that is really awkward for the reader. So I'll go ahead and name the character now. As ever fix, it still needs to internalize. Mm -hmm. Yikes. Poor guys. I know. Well, good to know. Yeah. I will. We, have, we actually did choose internalize, but yeah, weird. Mm. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. The writer must be that's a sad. <laughs> He's like, but my dreams. No, but they're gonna read it. But my dreams. Yeah, I'll play next week. Oh, that's that is a bummer though. I'll okay, check it so, out. Sorry, oh, yeah. this might be important. Get your call ID. Sends it to voicemail. Never mind, it's just my fiance. She resumes kissing Jake, but he pulls back. You're engaged. She's like holding up her engagement ring in her own hand. I thought that was to keep guys from hitting on you. Come on, engage. You look like you're 24, maybe 25. I'm 22. Hmm. Don't worry, you're one of my five. So, Andy's totally cool with this. Did we just... One of my five? One of my five? Maybe she has five boyfriends? Uh, I don't know. Five seems odd and less explained. Yeah. Soon. Um... Yeah, it just seems like this random kind of device where I don't really, I'm like, whoa, what's one of the five? Like, that's yeah. very interesting. <laughs> uh, don't worry, you're one of my five, so Andy, it's totally cool. Okay, didn't we just meet tonight? 
It's a general lick. Five Phoebe sexy times without Andy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh. Like, one of his five is an Olympic gold medalist. So, say, for instance, he comes across Christina uh, Kowalski or Elena Dementieva in their game, he gets a pass. That's a pass. Oh, but too. how is this person they just met a pass? Yeah, I guess we'll find out. Okay. So, what umbrella would I fall under? The world Sarah sexiest karaoke singers? She, move, he, she moves in to kiss her and she smiles and says... Guy over 40. She completes the kiss and pulls and he, and he pulls away. I'm not 40. Come on. I'm not. Let me see your driver's license. I don't, I don't have it. I think, it's, I think it's at home. How'd you get into the bar? Oh, obviously you didn't get caught in. Jake appears stung as she looks to the ceiling. So, do I go? Well, since I can't exactly check, are you sure you're not 40? She looks at him suggestively, hoping, hopefully, he'll, hoping he'll go along. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, she exhales and moves to leave. I think I'm gonna go. Wait, you're not like 39 and a half, are you? I'm not 40. Ben, 60. He Jake's is. Wait, he is. Oh, he is. Is that necessary? Yeah. Uh, so I'll use a parenthetical. Yeah, right? yeah, good, good spot. Um, maybe, like, so I would have him, like, check his driver's license at the door. Maybe he checks mm -hmm. his driver's license on the way out. Uh, and it says, like, you know, 40. Because <laughs> 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 I guess the year doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like the time. Math. Exterior golf course day. There's an AARP card. Ben Jake's dad, a chronic warrior, bends to cliff, late 50s and acts 70s. Late 50s, perennial bachelor. A lot of rapid fire character interactions uh, and a lot of characters. Um, two so far. Well, three. there's three. So it's Chick, oh, Jake, four. Ben, Cliff, TJ. On page three. Mm. So that so that's the whole thing. So you only were like I think there's like one or two, but they're you know that doing that kind of packed in intro it brings exactly that response from the reader, which is like wait, who's who? Uh, if these Three characters matter. Uh, give more time to intro each. If they don't, cut them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, 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 as mean as that sounds, you know, you really kind of have to be that um, rigorous about trimming. Uh, I don't know what the hell to do about the kid. There's nothing you can do. He's a grown man. There's got to be something. Like what? You want to brainwash him? I wish I could. He's 39 years old. It's now 39. He had been married almost 20 years, and he's 39 and sleeping with almost 20-year-olds. And you should see the way he lives. It's like walking into a frat house. Honest to God, I don't even think he owns dishes. You know, he keeps going the way he's going. He's going to end up all alone. I hear you, Ben. The last thing he wants is for Jake to end up like... He nods over at TJ, throwing up a peace sign as he records a snapshot of himself walking up the golf course. He's going to have to figure... Oh. But he's going to have to figure this out for himself. Until he does, you're just going to have to be patient. Ben removes his hat, swept the sweat off his forehead. Strands of hair remain stuck inside as he shows Cliff. How much more patient can I be? I ain't getting any younger. Ugh, don't show me that shit. Shoot. Ben steps up to the tee off. He's sweating has intensified. He's getting short of breath. You okay? You're looking like Tony Segruza right now. I'm fine. But Ben doesn't look so good. As he lifts his club, he almost falls over and TJ catches him. Whoa, okay, have a seat, man. They open the golf cart. Get him something to drink. Cliff unscrews his flask and gives it to Ben for a pull. You want to head back? We already paid for the round. You're ridiculous. No, you guys go ahead. I'll wait in the clubhouse. I'll be okay. You sure you can drive back? Ben waves him on and they drive off and the guys dash over. Jake, pounding a 20-ounce Red Bull, carries chi carrying Chinese takeouts, walk walks with Morgan, 30s. Customer taking Jake's abuse, Morgan slips milk with a straw from a car small carton. So we move into her bedroom, and then I get her bra off, and then you won't believe what happened. Stop it, I don't want to know. You really don't want to know? Well, all the voices. <laughs> Top tier. My thing is, none of these guys really stand out. Yeah, I, don't, I can't keep track. And of there's them. lots of them. Yeah, because because there are so many, I think it's okay if you like make them unique, but they're all kind of the same. I don't know who's who. Uh, uh, okay, 
read it once and I don't remember. Yeah, I mean, I, I like, like, you know, the Ben seems to be the practical guy. Cliff is, like, the, you know, the older dude, and TJ is, like, the just the bro-down showdown. But then you're adding another person, which is Morgan, which is, like, is it someone he's dating? I don't know. Can't Maybe it's just, like, the best friend. Girl, even. Yeah, it could be a boy. Maybe she... I was thinking it was a guy, but now I'm not sure. Oh, it's Morgan. The customer taking Jake's abuse. Morgan sips. Now it doesn't even have a gender tag. Mm. Looks at his milk cart, and I thought it was a chick. Oh, you did? See, I thought it was a guy. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Um, then that goes down to the character intros. Another one that I think needs work. Yeah. Care intro should be a bit more in-depth. Uh, as well. Especially if he's also going to be. But then you have this other girl, Lita, down here. Um, so, like, you know, we're you're kind of continue to add on this cast of characters and usually if you're over and you're kind of over like the you know one character per page like limit right where it's like okay we got a lot of people um though you know people do this i've done this but like uh you know you really want to be careful especially um you know giving the extra time to introduce them and then if you're going to introduce like five people at once like give it a breather for a while let a scene play out so so far we bump between three scenes, and the only thing that's really had a scene turn has been the first one with, like, the age joke. Um, the other guy kind of got sick, but that didn't really have, like, him, like, dead or anything. So, like, that doesn't really amount to much. Um, so, like, I'm still kind of waiting for that, like, you want, like, kind of a full sequence. Something tying together, like, a, a piece of the story. So, I would probably say, um, you know, at this point... Few half scenes, um, but no full sequence of action yet. Uh, cool. I mean, I think the writing is pretty good. And the dialogue's funny. Yeah. I feel like maybe we should have stayed with Jake a bit longer before meeting his dad and his dad's friends. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it goes back to like you're, he's blasting through all these characters and he's not spending enough time with with the important Honestly, ones. Honestly, I forgot that Jake was the same guy as the first scene. Yeah. Uh, so that's that kind of no, that's all good. I'll probably we'll probably jump to Smishmoosh's stories, which is exciting. Smishmoosh, smoosh. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I think um, the things that I would say are, and I know this is a turbo motor view, which would be um, let me see. Um, so I like the dialogue and humor, uh, and then I think the um, funny, interesting. I would say lots of characters. How do they don't stand out? Um, no forward drive. I mean, usually, even if it's not the main goal of the story, you want somebody to be wanting and pushing for something. Like, you know, it's like, in every scene, like, nobody's really wanting anything, like, these guys, you know, Jake, you know, he kind of hooks up and he's embarrassed, whatever, that's kind of closest to a real scene, but this one, for example, you know, they're just kind of shooting the, shooting the bull about Jake and playing around at golf, like, that is, you know, very, very minimal conflict in that scene, and that's not going to really have that momentum um, that you need to kind of fuel a plot, right, especially in the early phases. Uh, same here, they're just kind of talking about recapping what already what the reader already knows happened um you know and he's making a joke it was like a sprinkler you know like the lactating joke okay cool but like that's still just a recap but a humorous recap and that's not even about the first girl is it no so she's lactating that she has a five well i think he's making it up uh, oh wait no i think it's a different girl i think okay it's a different girl like, oh, he's a player yeah. Got a five month old hunter, cute little dude. Okay, maybe that is true. So then it's like, whoa. And there's another one, Lydia got you know, Lydia's pissed. And then I bet there's Tonya now is a new character. So I mean even like and that's why like, you know, you can usually tell pretty early on like where the where the challenges the writer's encountering is, uh, is because, you know, usually those show up from page one. Uh, and, and these seem to be kind of in that in that vein. 
Okay, well, well done. I think this is really good. I think my vote was probably going to go with Eternal Lies. Do you agree? Yeah. All right. And then we're going to make a new one here for Shmish. Shmish. Yeah, that's how you spell it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and I crashed a golf cart? Really? Yeah, Did this reminds me of mine. Our first draft, be gentle. Yeah, oh, no worries. <laughs> we'll be structure editing. First ever? Oh, yeah, no worries. You're not. Nah, I mean we're we're pretty we're pretty low key. Eh? Well, at least I think we're low key, but maybe I'm intense. This is how I, I review really my own writing. Grammar. I don't, but like nothing. Everybody makes grammar mistakes. I just hate misspellings. I'm I'm just really I just am an intense person, so maybe I just review my writing really harshly. She can she can tell you I like sit around I'm like this is crap. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I you know, but I usually it's actually not, not too bad. Too bad. It's a little crap. Okay, cool. Dialogue stuff is fixable. Dialogue stuff is fixable. The magic, okay, um, so, off we go into the magic ferret. The magic ferret. Somebody say Loki. Loki. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep it low-key, you know? You get it, no. Yeah, I get it. You get it. Yeah, I got it, okay. You got it. My great jokes. All right, let's see here. Um, let's see here. Dashboard. So I can make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh, that's so very confused. All right. Oh, you have thousand views. Yeah. Crazy. Lifetime views. Not like right now. Oh no. <laughs> Though you know. Are you saving this? Yes. Uh huh. It could be on YouTube. The Fred Unawick of Corner Gas. I don't know who Fred is. Okay. Where's my picture thing? Oh, well, whatever. I was looking for something, but I'm dumb. Are you saving this broadcast? Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, right. Unless you don't want us to. And we can, I can reset. Okay. So, let me know. Um, okay, cool. Science lab, night. A research lab filled with caged animals of all sorts. A lab assistant in her 30s, large and muscular, wearing a button-up blue jumpsuit. This is Frank. Frank fills water bottles for all the cages, dunking each in each bottle in a bucket of fresh water. He greets each animal by the number. So this is... I'm fine, yes I do. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Just making sure. Um, so one thing to be aware of is this is something that happens a lot in my first draft especially, is you'll find words that are close to each other, like each and each, uh, and they kind of will will kind of jar the reader a little bit because whenever you're, you're reading, you kind of you're whenever you have like two of the same words, like you kind of connect them subconsciously. So just be aware of that. It's jarring to the reader. Each. In Jeffrey's words. <laughs> I have my troll, my my in-house troll, yeah. my editing troll. Yeah. Okay, Frank, here you go. 1784. Frank arrives in an empty cage. The bars have been bent just wide enough for a small critter to escape. No! Not specified. 1989. F. Frank drops a bucket and sprints out of the lab. Dr. Murray, emergency, emergency! Uh, exterior, science lab continues. A large sign in the building reads, Telekinesis Research Lab. Um, hmm. So one thing to think about... And, you know, this is obviously not, uh, you know, anything. So, it's always a little bit less, like, you know, drama is always action on scene, right? So, it's always a little bit less dramatic when you see the result of something as opposed to something happening. Um, magic ferret. Um... So, for example, in this case, if it's a magic ferret, like, it's cooler for me to see, like, the ferret stare at the bars and the bars start bending out and, like, ah, that goes through and it's, like, magical. Um, so, so that, um, I, I do it all the time with the, with the, yes, 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 uh, but with the, um, you know, consider making those moments in scene. It's not required, uh, you may have a purpose for doing it this particular way. 
But if it was just how it kind of fell on the first draft, that would be something I would consider is, um, you know, bring the action to the scene. It's more fun. Unless it seems to be like a surprise. Then it's a fair confession. That is pretty cute. Two. Yeah, and that would be like, hey, if you have like a really specific reason, like there's going to be a big ferret reveal at the end, great. <laughs> I'm just going to actually put this on my script notes, just so it's all in one. Shmoosh, shmoosh, the magic ferret. Mink. Okay. It would be cool to like play it out as like it's this big animal, and then it turns out to be a ferret. That's yeah, I think it's like a monster. Yeah. Oh my gosh. All right, the largest sign in the building reads, Telekinesis Reach at Lab, Thunder and Lightning Success. It's not a nice place. The bush shakes, giving an impression of something sinister hiding within There we it. go. Yay. Reveal. The rustling becomes intense until, emerging from the bush, we meet specimen 1989F. A very cute See, bird. I like that. I think that okay. works well. I concur. Never mind. <laughs> Yay, you're the cute bird. Never mind that. <laughs> uh, interior school classroom warning. The children's drawings of various animals line the top of a chalkboard. Miss... Rasensky, Rasenti, Rasenti, 40s, wearing a black sweater vest over, hey, hey what's up, Gumi? So I forget about mystery, haha. Huh? See how like, he spelled my name again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so interior school classroom morning, children's drawings of various animals, land attack of the chalkboard. 40s, wearing a black sweater vest over a button, white blouse, watches from her desk in front of the class as Randy ate. Loose baggy t-shirt finishes his show and tell. He holds a roll of TP up for the class to see. And there you can see my piece of wood in the toilet paper. My mom said I'm lucky I didn't get a sliver right up my... That's fine. Thank you, Randy. The class giggles. Uh, I get a silver... Sliver. Sliver. It's a piece of wood in the toilet paper. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. The class <laughs> giggles. Randy bows and takes a seat. Okay, and next we have Sam. Sam ate small for his age. Unruly mop of hair, he's dressed to the nines, sport jacket, bow tie, everything a little too big, and purchased at the local thrift store. Sam strides to the front of the class, ignoring the groans and whispers of his classmates. Peyton, nine, blonde hair pulled back tight with a hot pink scrunchie, rolls her eyes. Her desk is pushed up against the desk of her two best friends, Savannah and Taylor. So this is kind of a similar kind of uh, challenge that you're going to run into that some of the other, uh, other writers... Um, and I think had earlier, which is, you know, one, you have Frank, uh, a scientist. His introduction here, um, the ferret, which is kind of a character introduction, Miss Rosinski, and then about six classmates. Um, so one of the challenges you're going to run into is it's going to be hard to, um, you know, really know who to follow. I'm pretty sure it's Sam. Um, but, you know, there's just a lot of characters. Um, beware... Yeah, I guess he do need an intro. Ugh. It's tough. I mean, in some ways, you've seen people get around. Yeah, I know. That's what I was thinking. It's like, well... Sometimes, so the way... Uh, okay, delete him. Maybe I should intro her later and not miss him. Oh my gosh. Good gracious. Goonie Hendai. <laughs> uh, beep. Rip. Rip Goomy. <laughs> um, anyways, but, yeah, I think that the challenge is when you have lots of, um, when you have, like, a ton of different, you can do it a few ways. Like, one is you don't have to introduce everyone that's in the room the first time. You can just introduce the key players in that scene. So if it's only, like, Miss, the, the teacher, the kid, and, like, his ferret, uh, and then, you know, the kids can, like, then you can introduce, like, after class, like, this girl, like, bumps him, and she's, like, a bully, and then he's, like, oh, hey, like, I saw your presentation, uh, but that's not the best case. I think this is still the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, if someone's in a scene, you want to enter them, but I would just make sure if it's, like, if they have to be there. It's just kind of, that's a tough thing to pull off, or I would just highlight Sam a lot more. 
Um, or like maybe not Savannah and Taylor. Like maybe we don't need to know who Savannah and Taylor are. Yeah, I I would agree because in unless they come into play, but it sounds like they're not because there's no ages or. Yeah, I mean, I think Savannah and Taylor are probably just her sidekicks, and those could yeah. be it, like we can just pretend they're in another class now, and they can come in later and like you mm-hmm. know have battles or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm. The bully. Yeah. Here comes another stupid magic trick, the girls laugh. Mr. Rosinski points at Peyton, which brings immediate silence. Um, yeah, so then if they're cronies, you can probably get away with just pretending they're not in this class and then introducing them, like, joining her later. Mm-hmm. Or at least having, like, her, f- like, after she tells the joke. So then you don't have to blast it all into one, like, action mm-hmm. segment. You can have, like, Peyton does this, she tells a joke, her friends, Samantha and whatever, laugh. Miss Ranska, yeah, and then we know they're cronies, and we know we don't have to keep track of them immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you, maybe it's just, like, staggering it a little bit, but that, like, those three lines, that, like, kind of, like, those that three block will be tough to manage, I think. Um, here to be amazed. I'm the great... I do it, Sam Bainey. We'll perform the greatest of magic. <laughs> I like your <laughs> Sam voice. Sam slowly writes his name on the checkboard. The great. Peyton laughs. Can you spell his own name? Sam continues. <laughs> Sam B stares at the board for a long time. Oh, and yeah. Oh, <laughs> poor oh, Sam. Sam. Sam spins around, disconcerted by what would normally be a humiliating. Dis- so now I will need a volunteer from the audience. The kids stare at Sam. <laughs> I like your <laughs> Sam voice. It's just my voice. Yeah, it is really just your voice. <laughs> Peyton and Taylor pop up, pop bubblegum in unison. I volunteer, Sam. <laughs> Sam fans out a deck of cards. Pick a card, then show it to the audience. She does. For Sam, sounds <laughs> developmentally disabled. <laughs> he's a sweet boy. <laughs> yeah, he's a sweet boy. <laughs> Smish Smash likes it. I love the voice. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> you can be the act, the uh, voice actor. Uh, Randy's head rests on toilet paper as he falls asleep. Now put it back. Miss Rosinski puts the card back into his desk. Sam reshuffles. Is this your card? Yes, amazing, Sam. <laughs> School bell rings. The kids are out, snickering and laughing, nearly knocking Sam over as he bows. What a nerd. Samuel, your writing needs some improvement. She collects his cards from the desk. How have, have your parents been helping you practice? They're on tour doing magic shows. My dad says if I can get a B average, I can go to magic camp this summer. You're a long way off from a B average. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, this is genius for everyone. So good goal, uh, magic camp, and B average. So yeah, that's well done. Establishing that early, it's good to see that there is some, you know, something that's driving the character forward. Um. They're on tour doing magic shows. They're a long way off from a B. Can my aunt and uncle help me? I'm staying with them. I'll give them a call. We'll make sure you get that B. Sam skulks out, shoulders low. Scams at his locker, inside of which is adorned by various pictures of magicians. Hauled around Peyton a few lockers away. They're now joined by Violet, a soft brown eyes, who steals a peek at Sam while the trio of girls aren't looking. Oh, nice. The voice of the school principal comes on the PA system. Good afternoon, teachers and students. Just a reminder that the only spectacular student showcase extravaganza is this Friday at 1 o'clock. Mr. Winston, 50s, overly positive demeanor, addresses the school on the PA system. And the winner of this year's contest will compete at the riveting regional talent show. Isn't that just fantastic? Danny Cho, tucked in a pallid pack. Tired. I uh, have boxed a few musical notes on a xylophone. <laughs> the winner will also receive automatic A plus in the arts, which will be applied to their overall greed average. <laughs> Sam's eyes light up as he listens. So, if you want to avoid summer school, sign up for the student showcase extravaganza. An A plus? That's my ticket to magic camp. <laughs> Maybe the great Dumbini will do one of his. Lame. Lame card tricks. I'm blind. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Her gang all laugh, except Violet, who holds her books tight. My tricks aren't lame. 
I'm going in that show, and everyone's going to love my act. You'll see. Peyton gets right in Sam's face. So I know that is a kid's, uh, a kid's movie, and I think you've been doing a good job of kind of making the dialogue um, pretty unique, but that's something that I would, uh, at least in this kind of section with, like, my tricks aren't lame, um, it's very, like, it's expressing exactly what the characters think. Um, so usually what you would see in, like, more, which is tough to do with, with kids, uh, is, you know, you would see in more adult fiction is instead of responding exactly to the insult, like his lame card tricks, he would, he would, people would, like, you know, a human would retaliate, right, and be like, well, you're failing your class, so shut up, like, you know, like, those types of things are usually more, one, it's good because of more conflict, um, but then two, it's a little bit less on the nose, because, you know, whenever the character's saying exactly what they're thinking, like, hey, no, I'm not lame, like, that seems a little bit, um, staged, though it may be important, um, that would be something I would kind of take a deeper look at, um, um, dialogue here in this scene seems a bit uh, cool and this year okay and this year my act is even more amazing your little card tricks won't s well last year I was the audience choice award oh that's Peyton and this year my act is even more and this year my act is even more amazing your little card tricks won't stack up dumpy Anything is possible when you believe in magic. You must be a magician, because every time I see you, I want to disappear. Peyton and her, gang, and her gang head off cackling. Violet hesitates, but Savannah nudges her so she, she obediently follows. So good job showing uh, Violet here. I think that's really well done. Um, good show with Violet. And I think, you know, I think what's nice is, especially for kids' movies, you can see where the, the setup and the character's plot and drama connect, which is good. Like, I know he's a magic guy. This seems to be some sort of ferret. You want to hold this just for a second? I'll let me grab it. <sighs> Something to keep your boiling laptop. Good day. The boiling laptop, yeah. Um, zero on the script shot of discus. Nice. Oh, I'm excited. It's a good script so far. I think it's pretty well done. Thank gotta you. work on subtext. It's this tough. I gotta work on subtext. Helpless? Yeah, I think it was on. Was this on script shadow? No, this is. I oh, know, but like, no, but this is Smishmoshes. But I didn't know if Smishmosh put it on script shadow. But anyways, um, but yeah. So I, I mean, I think subtext is tough for everybody. But more of it is, um. Just, yeah, looking for, like, that more human reaction, which, like, you know, if it was me, I would probably be a bit retaliatory and defensive, which is, like, what people do. At least, you know, it just happens when people kind of call your, you know, act dumb and stuff like that. So, you know, I think that's, um, that, that I, don't, I don't think you should take that suggestion, because that may be tough on your character, but, um, who knows. Uh, Sam looks up the poster inside the locker, Tatton's Magic Camp, July 16th, or July 9th. Those who don't believe in magic will never find it. He closes his locker with confidence, determined to prove Peyton wrong. So, this is a little bit hard to visualize. Um, I would just do something with a determined look on us, like a determined like frown, um, because, you know, that's that's one of those kind of grayer areas, but... Um, uh, but maybe, like, this character has a special way of showing determination, where he, like... Tightens his magic out, you know, over his head or something like that, like with a determined and, like, gaze. Points at himself in the mirror and like gives himself a smile. So those like telling moments, you're usually also missing out on an opportunity to characterize a little bit, which is always really nice, and being able to get that extra little bit of characterization. Like maybe he straightens his magic hat, whatever that looks like, but then you can use it later, and it's a callback when like someone's like you know the big challenge, and you see him tighten his magic hat again, then you're like, oh, he's determined, like. Perfect. Um, so those are the types of things that seem like small things early, but if you're able to use them later uh, and use it for characterization, can be can reap uh, a lot of a harvest to a certain degree. Nice facial expression was yeah. It's all good. And Gemma, colorful feather earrings, rouge, <laughs> rose, rouge sweater. If I can pronounce things, and about six different necklaces. Sits in a lazy boy chair. She sips green smoothie from a glass pitcher. 
very long red hair with a gray streak in the front, and a matching chair admiring herself. A matching chair admiring a small handheld mirror is a red and green African American parrot. This is Uncle Jackson. Yeah. Sam enters, dumping his backpack on the floor. You're gonna be grandma, or I can be grandma. Oh yeah, you be grandma, and I'll be. How was school, Sammy? Fine. And show and tell. Those kids don't understand magic. Oh no, I suppose they don't. I'm gonna enter the talent show on Friday. Uncle Jackson, can you help me with my routine? Jackson flies onto Sam's shoulders. Brock, showtime! <laughs> Later. Later, Bye, Casey. Casey. Hope your riding's going good. Take care. Stay with the... Stay in the yard, you two. Gemma puts her hand on the telephone, hesitates, and goes back to sipping her smoothie. Great Exterior, life. backyard. I know. Get one blade with a parrot in this movie. <laughs> you already are. A I know. With a cat in this movie. Yeah. Doesn't that count? Cats um, count. I don't think it would get along with a parrot in a maria. No, she did. Sam or the parrot. Or try. Parrots would fight back. Yeah. yeah. It's fun to hear some parrots. Yeah, I always like I always like table raids. <laughs> well, helpful. I uh, when I wrote my screenplay many moons ago, um, I would, I made my poor friends. I put it up on the TV through HDMI, and then I made them read it out loud. Adam and Chase and, and Eric. Oh it's poor souls. I don't think Adam wouldn't do very many voices. No, he did not. He's like he's a silly. Uh, uh, he did actually did Montero voice. He did a Montero voice that was pretty funny. He was like the gangster Mexican guy. Oh really? He's like, ah oh, man. Really? <laughs> so funny. Yeah. He's a Jewish Asian. He's a Jewish Asian. So That's what makes it funny. gangster Mexican doesn't really match yeah. up all the time. Yeah. But you never know. Sam showing a card. Is this your card? Brock Lane. Jackson kicks a cup, knocking over the castle. Hey. Checks over kids. I am a kid. Jackson, your show's on. Jackson flies off and meets Gemma. Oh my goodness, yeah. it just jumped around. Okay. Sure Who carries him inside? Hey. hey, who's gonna help me practice? Sam places his head on the table and scratches his chin. Out of nowhere, a gust of wind picks up the hat. I would capitalize, though, different schools of thought, the way I, which was obviously, I didn't, I've learned all my screenplay form like in 2010, so I could be wrong now. <laughs> but I usually avoid bold. Go with caps. Just this random style note. If you heard somebody else say something different, they're probably right because I haven't gotten too deep into screenplay formatting in many moons. Um, that's gonna help Whoa, me. Wow! Come back here. Sam chases the hat to the back of the alley behind his house. Sam's top hat is sliding along the ground. He chases it and picks it up to reveal the ferret, also known as Specimen 1989F. Holy capoli! The ferret chirps, a short of chortling sound that it stands on its hind legs. How did you get here? The ferret scampers up to Sam and puts one paw on his shoe. Sam picks it up and holds the ferret in front of its face. Are you lost? Sam okay. looks around. <laughs> Are you the ferret? Are I you have my paw on you. Oh, thank you, ferret. I put one paw on your shoe. That's very yeah. nice of you. Are you Sam looks around over inside. The ferret licks his cheek. <laughs> Sammy? <laughs> oh, the... <laughs> oh, you get banned. <laughs> Just kidding. For being inappropriate. Being inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't worry, I'm wearing deodorant. Come, come in, your aunt, Grandma. Aunt Gemma. Aunt Gemma. So this is interesting. So usually, and this is more of a <coughs> caution. Uh, one thing to think about is there's not much heavy conflict here. <coughs> I mean, there's light stuff, like the bird kind of joking and saying he's lame, too, and he kind of is bummed out. Um, but it's kind of light. Um, but the thing I'm more concerned about is that meeting is, like, when, whenever, like, the person meets their magical, you know, whenever they meet, I forget, like, the it's like, the, it's like it's called like the spirit animal or the hero's journey or whatever. But like whenever someone encounters that, and this is kind of like a like reminiscent of that, right? Is it's usually conflict heavy, or it's, there's usually something happening, or you know it's it's this is a very idyllic meeting for someone meeting like the the key. 
uh, so it seems like almost given to him and not earned. Mm. Um, it's not like the fairies are running from somebody who has to like, hide him or something. Yeah, oh, there's not a choice. Like, for example, like, what if there were scientists chasing the ferret and he, like, has to choose to defend the ferret and not give it up to the scientists? Like, for me, that would be much more, one, you giving a, your character a tough decision like that to make early in the screenplay just makes that character pop a lot more, um, but then it also makes that relationship with his scion, uh, you know, whatever, much more meaningful, right? Um, the meeting of ferret. Uh, so Sam make a choice so that he's worthy of his great Um, so yeah, so like making the hero worthy of its, it, his boon is a very important thing, especially in traditional hero's journeys, which I imagine this will probably be, be marching along those okay. beats. So you can make maybe, um, forbid him to do magic. Oh, yeah. Interesting, yeah. That's true. I would make it in character too, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, whatever works, that would, that would work the forbidden. Forbidden magic. He, like, has to hide outside and, like, you know. Yeah, but that, you're right. It adds conflict um, and, you know, it shows the determination. Because you told me he's determined, but unless I see him overcome stuff to do his thing, you know, it, 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 um, it seems a bit more, like, surface level. Coming in, Jenna. Hallway moments later. Sam tiptoes on the hallway past the living room. Where Gemma is watching TV with Jackson, zooms up the stairs, Sam sits cross-legged on his bed. The room is full of magic-related posters, glow-in-the-dark sheets, okay, cool stuff. Hops playfully, enjoying its soft surroundings. I wish I could keep you, but my Uncle Jackson's allergic to pets. Okay, so that's a good kind of intro to, like, some sort of, like, conflict. Uncle Jackson is the Which is funny because he's a parrot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The ferret digs at his Sam's shorts and picks him up. It's a long story, so what should I call you? How about... Sam scans around the room. His eyes land on a child's drawing of Snot Man, a giant green booger in red spandex. Booger? The ferret sneezes, shaking his head. Sam wipes the snot off his face. Yuck. Okay, maybe not. Sam looks again, this time at David Copperfield's poster behind the floor. Behind the door. I know. Copper! Like David Copperfield, the greatest magician ever. Copper chirps and licks Sam's cheek. Sammy, come set the table, please. Sam jumps off his bed. You stay here, okay, Copper? Copper chips. Good boy. As soon as Sam's gone, Copper carefully slides down off the bed. He slips and lands with a thud. Um, yeah, so I would say that probably now... So you have his goal. Um, but soon you'll be wanting to look for, like, the big challenge. Or, like, whatever the obstacle is his goal. And I think because Penny or his, his classmate is not a very strong character, like, she kind of seems like the, kind of just the bully type, she only seems like a minor obstacle. I see that, you know, Sam's big obstacle will be choosing between, like, getting the show and maybe his ferret and taking care of his ferret. Like, some mm -hmm. sort of thing where he's putting... Maybe his magic powers will, like, yeah. have all these funny effects. I want to see his magic powers. Yeah, so, like, whatever the character's flaw is will be what blocks them from their goal to a certain degree, because whatever is truly stopping characters from getting what they want is themselves, right? So whatever that character's flaw is, like his lameness, his relying on his friend, the real way he's going to win that contest is by overcoming that. So I'm going to be wanting to start looking for that. So Sam seems kind of, like, sweet, a little bit made fun of, but there's not really much, like, internal like gray area with how he's choosing things or like you know and obviously he's like a little kid but you know you still kind of want some of those like moral like oh like my parents are gone this feels bad i feel insecure because of this and then if it's overcoming insecurity there has to be some sort of like thing that represents insecurity that he has to beat um okay it drops with a thud sam jackson i missed the comments i'm behind a little bit oops 
I agree, too convenient. Hi, hey, Ocean. Hello, Ocean. I can't read well. Can't read magic books. I'm still learning tricks and can't get it to be average. I see. Um, so, and he can't, so he can't go to magic. So I think one thing I would think of, so I actually really like that. So I think that's a great representation of, a, of like a deep character flaw. So... Mac Daddy is on the fence of yeah. banning. It's like right there on the ledge. He's like, yeah. I want to jump. Don't jump, Mac Daddy D. You have so much. You have so many positive comments to make for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Not like this. Like this. Uh, but anyways, um, but I think the thing I would think about really is a flaw is usually a moral flaw. So there's like the flaw of, uh, so this is actually, there's a really good series of screenplay lectures by John, John Truby. I didn't do nothing. I swear to God, <laughs> I'm innocent. <laughs> it's all good, uh, but 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 usually, like the moral flaw is what the character truly has to overcome, and that's more like, how am I hurting the world because of something that I don't believe about myself, and how am I hurting others? And it could be that I am so you know insecure that I don't take action when I need to, uh, and I don't like you know, s like, stand up for somebody. Like, maybe someone's getting picked on, too, and Sam doesn't stand up for them. And that means he's so insecure that he's letting someone else get hurt because he's scared of, like, being exposed. Um, or maybe he, like, vows to stop doing magic after his show because he's so insecure he's going to, you know, hurt the world by s not being creative in it any longer. So you're right. Like, I think that could man it. Like, his moral flaw can manifest itself through bad reading, bad spelling, but maybe the reason he's not good at spelling... Yeah, yeah. So we are editing Smish Smoosh's uh, screenplay. So this screenplay here... It's about a magic ferret. It's about a magic ferret, and then we're ta we're doing kind of like a, a, a read-aloud edit and the notes. And hey. There's Bowen. Hey, Bowen. Hi, guys. Game of Thrones. <laughs> if you guys haven't watched Game of Thrones tonight, it's amazing. So yeah, so what we're talking about right now is usually when you have your heroic character, you want that character to have a flaw that they can overcome to get their goal. Um, and right now I think that's probably something that, that maybe seems a little bit underdeveloped, though I think the character still has some pretty good external flaws, like he can't spell, he can't read that well, um, but those internal flaws, like what am I morally doing that's wrong? That I have to that I have to change in order to be worthy mm -hmm. of re of achieving my goal. Um, those are the types of things that um, I think may you may want to you know at least look in as you go into future drafts. Um, character flaw, external. Should I send you to bed soon? Yeah. Okay. So we may. Uh, we may have to sign off early, and then I can read your your second one, Smish Smoosh, soon. You can hear you. Hey, Bob. <laughs> that one. I hear you. It's, it's uh, good stuff. Uh, Sam, Gemma, and Jada. So what we'll do, Smish Smoosh, is we'll finish reading this one, or at least we'll go a little bit further because mm -hmm. I kind of want to see what happens. Yeah, and yeah. then next weekend when you're, or, or if I yeah. come up on Wednesday, we can and do the second and one. Like if if you want, yeah, like, we can finish it later, too. Yeah. I just gonna get home. Just getting old. Getting sleepy. Okay, you got work early. tomorrow, sadly. <laughs> Sam, Jim, and Jackson are eating macaroni and cheese. Jackson is on the table. Place Matt nibbling at a plate of seeds. Did Uncle Jackson ever have a pet? Bark, no pets. Jackson is flinging seeds off his plate with a beak. Why would you ask that? Well, Uncle Jackson was a magician, and magicians always have assistants. Maybe Wait, I... isn't the parrot... Yeah, I think he's talking to the parrot. But the parrot's Uncle Jackson. The, the parrot was a magician? I guess, or maybe he was like... I don't know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm thinking of the parrot's Uncle Jackson, I thought, but maybe I'm mistaken. Yeah. Jackson's allergic to animals. Jackson tilts its head at Jamma uh, and avoids eye contact. Eat your seeds, Jackson, I know, but... Don't worry about being just like everybody else, Sam. Just be yourself. Jackson needs to be a human? <laughs> what? what? No, Jackson, your cholesterol. Huh. 
Huh. How are you doing with writing a report cards this week? Wait, so Jax needs to be a human? Did you she get did, that? Oh, she just got that. She's uh, oh, oh. Huh. So this is a magical world, for sure. Like. So if that's... I would have hinted that earlier. If that's something, uh, if, if it's true, um... Yeah, so if that's something that we just... If, if it's something you, the writer, know, and it's just kind of this funny thing about who he is... Um, that's, that's, that's fine. I think if that is possible in this world, I would definitely want to set that up. Is your dead husband reincarnated? Uh, ah, okay. Okay. That makes more that makes sense. sense. Um, and set up the... I still think that dynamic seems a bit vague, because, like, you know, it's, like, very stern about Jackson being allergic to animals, though he is an animal. Uh, those types of things are a bit, like, like funny, Jackie but like Gemma is kooky, cool. yeah. <laughs> believes, yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's right, I think, yeah, believes or is. Yeah. Uh, that's a very uh, important distinction, right? Since, uh... Yeah, and because, like, believes <laughs> is a Gemma character... Thing. Like, mm -hmm. if that means if she believes that, then she's it super is cooking. like a theme thing, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, that he really is. Okay. Nice. So, oh. I'm not surprised <laughs> it really is nice. But as long as, yeah, just make sure that surprise is, is well set up. Miss um, Rosenti says, I'm not going to get a B average. That's great news. May I finish dinner in my room? I want to study. Yes, you may. Sample uses this plate of food. Jackson circles around the glass of water. You could learn a thing or two from that boy about manners. <laughs> Co Cooper, Copper is standing on his hind legs on Sam's bed as stuffed animals, action figures, and toy trucks float midair. Toys are orbiting around the Copper when Sam opens the door. Holy crap, holy! Sam, Copper looks at Sam. Floating objects halt in their orbit, hovering in the air for a beat, and then drop to the floor. Thump, crash, bang. Sammy? Gemma's footsteps can be heard up the stairs. Ah, uh, quick, hide. Teddy bears fly from the floor over to the bed surrounding Copper. He blends in with the teddy bear faces, a perfect camouflage. Sam is stunned. Jenna opens the door. Sam spins around. Everything okay, Sammy? I heard a bang. I dropped my plate. So I think what's interesting is like, um, wish fulfillment type, like, stuff like this. Um, I would, I would watch a few of those movies. Like, um, you know, what is it? Blank Check was like a big one. Um, but I think one of the things is that's a theme usually in those is there's a price for the gift. Or, um, you know, or the, the hero does something to earn it. Um, so in this particular one, he just kind of walks up in this, this very, very magical and very well-attuned English ferret kind of pops up and is, is, you know, very helpful to all these cool things. But one thing I would really challenge you on in future drafts, or at least to think about, is is, is what makes our hero worthy of this uh, boon, of this of having his wish fulfilled, uh, and then what will eventually be the cost. So if you have a really easy setup like this, where it's like, oh, hey, it just kind of came. So that's like blank check, where, like, you know, he just kind of goes in the parking lot, this guy gives him a check. But then he learns the cost of getting his wrong wish fulfilled because like the kids want was like i think it was to have his like relationship with his mother like better like this family relationship so he just thought to bang that other chick what's that didn't he just want to like hook up with that like older chick maybe and bang check <laughs> i haven't seen the movie in years it was so weird but yeah something like that year old lady kissed him really yeah and he was like 12 <laughs> oh man i do anyways, not remember that anyways yeah, but, but that may be something you want to think about is to say, hey, if it's like a curse wish fulfillment, then it's something like blank check, where you where he wishes for the thing that's bad for him and he gets it. And then it then he has to deal with like the consequences and only in the end will he learn. Uh, however, with Matilda, um, you know, that's something where it's like a good wish fulfillment, where she deals with punishment punishment she reads she deals with this terrible family she's patient she's kind and then finally she like 
her mind like clicks on and then she like reads that right last book or whatever and then she becomes like a baller so those types of things are yeah you yeah. want to be rich yeah, yeah. exactly um sammy you better clean that up before jackson sees it you could get hurt and gemma and clean up your toys while you're at it it's your mess in here gemma leaves copper chirps teddy bear falls over phew science lab office day the walls are adorned with various diagrams of human brain and telekinesis long hair lab coat speaks in his landline on the telephone carefully to remove the ice cream cone is he always killed ice cream cone piece from the sand the patient's brain oh so he's playing operation oh wow <laughs> interesting that's funny i think like uh thank you yeah Mm -hmm. I think it matches with your tone, but it's right on the edge, I would say. Mm. Or it's like, we still have enough, like, concrete stuff where, like, completely, like, silly, out-of-the-ordinary jokes. Maybe, like, right on the fence. Because, like, some of the stuff, like, you have, like, the concrete relationships with that mean girl in class. That's pretty, like, real. Um, so, um, the operation joke visual is a bit on the edge of tampering. Tone. That was good. <laughs> it's like the evil scientist, like playing the game yeah, instead of like pulling someone's brain out for real. Yeah. Uh, what up, Cole Front? We could have we, we could have used the moderator power a few a few moments ago. Well, uh, we'll have to upgrade and submission to moderator soon. <laughs> <laughs> I assure you, plan everything is going to going to plan. It's good we're reading Miss Moose's screenplay. We're actually just coming to the conclusion of our exciting drama. Like but, uh, but yeah, Fox is sleepy. Should we finish page 13? Yeah. So, to it's prevent good, bad I, luck. I want to read more. I just got to drive home. I assure you that everything's going according to plan. Frank Swift. Who shall I destroy? We had a weird visitor earlier. Yeah. <laughs> It's a very, it's a very strong power. Wield, wield it wisely. I assure you that everything is going according to plan. Frank sweats as he watches Dr. Murray come dangerously close to touching the edges of the game board. The clock ticks on the wall. Dr. Murray continues the operation with focused intensity. Speaks, General Miller. I have a proven, without a shadow of a doubt, that we can tap into the creature's power of telekinesis. Dr. Murray successfully removes the ice cream cone and places it into the mental tray on his desk. Frank wipes his brow. It's funny. I like Just it. Like, yeah. But, like, it's still talking about what yeah. they want to do. Like, it's still, I feel like it's still moving the And that's forward. a good example of a scene agitator. That's what I think our other screenplay really could have used in one of their scenes when, where is that one? When they had, you know, just kind of these this people talking heads. Um, but having a scene agitator like that where they're playing, a, like, an operation game while they're talking gives it mm -hmm. so much more um, Especially because it's kind of silly, but yeah. what they're talking about is not silly. It's like... <laughs> It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Unfortunately, Twitch world. unfortunately, her school is in Vallejo and my school is going to be in San Francisco. If only there was just, like, no traffic, it wouldn't be bad at all. Yeah, it's like 20 minutes. Well, that's why it's nice driving at night, because it's easier. Yeah. If you don't find that telekinesis furball by noon tomorrow, you'll be fired. To but how am I going to find a little bitty ferret, boss? Specimen 1989F has a microchip implanted in his neck. Take this tracker. He can't hide for long. Mm. Dr. Murray hands Frank a small computer tablet, compete with an antenna and a big red button. The rubber brain keychain is attached. You got it, boss! Frank leaves. Murray works to remove the tiny horse resting near Sam. The patient's hip joint, but accidentally touches the edge and gets a buzz. Blast! Stupid game! <laughs> okay, good Here stuff. We Alright, we'll, we'll give our overall notes, so I think good. Um, you know, funny, a great comedy, actually. Yeah. It really is. Comedy, even for, like, kids. Yeah. Uh, which is tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I really like, um, like the character of Sam and that he has a strong role. I liked. <laughs> you liked it a lot. Light. <laughs> Fuck his spell. <laughs> See, it's getting late for a final bus no too hope, here. No hope for you. Alright, so what, what, else, what else should we uh, put on the good stuff? Oh, oh, why? Well, I thought it was good. Yeah. I liked the... It uh, was original. Um, yeah, actually it was... I have not heard of too many ferret telekinetic things before. Yeah. I 
Let's go. It seems heartwarming and yeah, I'm heartwarming. I would say the one things I would. Oh, and it had good goals. Good. Um, oh yeah. Was pretty good at sh showing and not telling. Yeah. There's like one instance where. I and then show and tell. Well done. Yeah, well, that's good. Transcends traffic. traffic. <laughs> it's true. If only. <laughs> Wait, what? I mean, yes. That's right. it. Dante up in Vallejo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a bad. It's not a bad drive, thankfully. No, not too too bad. Um, and then the stuff I would improve is I I really am probably going to lean heavily on the fact that um, flaw and um, moral flaw need to be thought out, be developed along with the external. So you have an external flaw, you're struggling with reading, but make it be the symptom of a deeper moral flaw, or, or at least a psychological trauma or, or damage um, that needs to be overcome. Like, I'm not valued by my parents. Like, those types of things are, like, very, they, they really do. I mean, one of my professors back in college many moons ago did child psychology, and she was a children's book writer. And those types of, like, um, those types of things are very important. So, like, they'll usually read, like, hey, from my age group, what are the kind of the things they're struggling with? And it's, like, stepping out of my own independence, fear of failure. Like, those are beginning to be really big struggles for these kids. And, you know, that's why art in that genre is so important because it can really help people think through those things. Um, and the other thing I would think about is um, the, the, the meeting of the ferret and... Um, becoming worthy of the scion. So, like, this could be a wish that's a curse. Uh, and, like, if it's like, hey, I want to get a bunch of money and get rich like that kid and, uh, and uh, blank check, and then that'll be okay. Um, you know, then it's like, okay... It's a curse. You can get the curse really easily, but then you have to deal with the consequences later. But this seems like this is a blessing, uh, and this will improve him. Um, so make sure that he's earning the right to get that. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I think this is really great work. Yeah. Uh, so for adults. Too, yeah, yeah, true story. Struggles for everybody. But anyways, like, great job. I'm going to type it in chat it. here. This is really well done. That was the best one I read today. Yeah, sure. I would say so. I think it was better than the Easter, Easter yeah. Island one. I wish it was on Amateur Friday so I could vote for it, but I'll put it in. I'll put my notes in the script shadow post. me. What about me? Uh, but yeah, I'll put these in the little Twitch uh, post feed thing because that's kind of cool. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, let me see if I can find something to host just so you guys don't get bored with having to, you know, do, you know, work or whatever. Unless somebody else wants to stream. Yeah. Unless somebody else is jumping on, I can host that for sure. But I always like to find some other good, good, good soul writer out there and give them a few extra, good, give them a few extra streams here. Writing. Ah, Neons27. Shitty writing. <laughs> yeah, seems like you could use an ego boost. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and sign off. You guys take care. Um, Bye. You can't stop, but I just got here. Oh, next weekend probably. Uh, the laser sloth probably yeah. next week. Yeah. Next weekend. Yes. Yeah, I will either be in Vallejo or I may even go up during this week as a surprise. Mm. I'm surprised. We'll see. <laughs> if uh, yeah, we'll see if. Uh, uh, if yeah, so things aren't crazy getting back from my week off. Yeah. I unfortunately have exams next week, so I'm going to be a bit landlocked over there. Yeah, so I'll probably be in Vallejo, so you'll have a different backdrop. And you might have a cat wandering <laughs> and through. And a cat wandering through during the during, during her <laughs> part two of Smishner's screenplay. Yeah, the cat mm -hmm. butts walking around. That's very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, y'all, take care. I'm sorry I, I, uh, we missed yeah, you, Colfront. But I'll probably be streaming writing this week most nights, so 
We'll uh. I'll pop on. Say hi. Oh <laughs> Stephen King. That's Stephen King. No. <gasps> yeah. I'll walk. Don't surprise, surprise me. Surprise visit. <laughs> oh no, baby. What? What are you doing here? It's just me and Stephen. Well, if it's Stephen King, that's fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll be like, as long as you get give me writing advice from the Grandmaster, you let me know. Anyways, y'all take hey, care. Have a good night.